Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us for another BrainX Community Live uh, session, uh, the August session for the year 2021. Uh, we have a couple of very exciting speakers uh, from the land of imaging, so we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But for those who are joining us for the first time, I want to give you uh, an idea about BrainX Community. We started this with the purpose of uh, people joining us for machine learning in healthcare for good. We have had three very successful years, now 3,000 plus member international, uh, strong international uh, community with quite a few different resources that we have built. The picture that you see is from, from our very first uh, physical meeting that we held uh, in Cleveland. And now we have grown to 3,000 plus member strong international community. And that's why we come to you uh, via video conferencing. A very strong and interactive uh, LinkedIn group called BrainX Community. So please try to join us. We share a lot of scientific information over there. And then we hold these uh, monthly sessions uh, to help spread uh, education and scientific information uh, related to machine learning or AI in healthcare. Uh, to give you a few different components of BrainX Community, this is from our web page. If you go over there, you'll find three key sections the, the connect, uh, data, and learn. Uh, connect hosts uh, our information from our prior meetings, from our prior speakers. This is an example of one that we had uh, a couple of years ago. So you can, if you, if you miss it, you can go and get some of, uh, get the information about those sessions and the speakers there. Uh, and now because we are doing video conferencing, so we have uh, stored the YouTube, uh, we have stored the videos and they're available through the YouTube channel. So please subscribe that and, and you can enjoy the learnings from these events over there. As I mentioned, a very active uh, LinkedIn group, and you know what uh, Ty has been uh, has been using that and sharing a lot of information for good for us. So thank you, Ty, for doing that. Uh, Learn section hosts uh, curated articles or publications uh, in the area of AI and healthcare. Uh, these are curated. They're tagged based on speciality. So if you have a particular speciality interest, you can go over there, you can find them, you can click on them. Of course, we can't provide you the article themselves, but we do provide you with the link to, to those. And then the data section, everybody is looking for data to build their own models, to learn from, to do research, to do their startup. So data hosts uh, one of the largest repositories of links to open source data sets. So if you want data related to healthcare, that's your one-stop shop. And these are now curated and tagged too. So they're tagged according to your specialty, just like in the learn section. So you can go and find data and build your models. And of course, you know, COVID-19 has struck us. So there is data related to, to COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, of course, we are talking about imaging. So there are a lot of data sets that are related to uh, imaging uh, for COVID-19. So go build your models with those. And then we had uh, extended our community to the Europe one and another session of that is coming soon. So please stay tuned. Uh, we have also provided a list of key journals which are specifically focused on data science or uh, AI in healthcare. So if you want to know which journals to follow, the list is over there and you, the links are provided for you to go there directly. And the idea behind this community was to foster collaboration. Here is an example of uh, that happening uh, between uh, some of the members here and uh, in India, uh, trying to solve the COVID-19 puzzle. And one of the newest features of our community is the, are the podcasts, uh, very exciting. Uh, we bring speakers from various walks of life, both from the engineering side and from the healthcare side. These are people who have done a lot, done a lot of work or published or have uh, led uh, AI in healthcare. Uh, and you can listen to them. You can learn about their experiences. And uh, hopefully uh, you can share them. Please subscribe the podcast and they'll come to your, your favorite podcast uh, device. Uh, earlier in the year, we published a year in review and uh, the context of showing you this publication is because Ty was one of the, the co-authors in that. And what really impresses me every single time is the number of publications radiology uh, has led with uh, for AI and healthcare. Uh, and goes without saying, you know, Ty has, uh, uh, has had a couple of books published on this. So we'll lo love to learn about 
you know, his experience writing those books and, uh, you know, sh share some of the learnings from that, uh, specifically related to, you know, the, the FDA approvals and all the different startups that are coming up in the sp imaging space. And I think a lot of other specialties have a lot of uh, room to catch up and uh, learn from, from imaging. So the two speakers are very exciting today. One is Ty Vichon, and I'm gonna let him introduce himself, but he is a diagnostic radiologist. He's, he's also the principal at uh, ORA Informatics and the CEO of, I'm going to misspell it, lesser.ai. And we have Kent Hall, he's the diagnostic radiologist and chief of staff for innovation health services. So these, they are our key speakers for today. And with that, I'm gonna turn it to Ty and Kent. Thank you. Awesome, well, thank you very much. Um, so uh, as, as you mentioned, I'm a diagnostic radiologist and I still do that part-time as evidenced by my giant radiology computer behind me. Um, I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about how many algorithms are FDA 510K approved um, and kind of what that means from a landscape standpoint. Then I'll pass it over to Kent where he'll do a little intro of himself um, and then talk about some uh, updates with neuro, with pulmonary and ultrasound algorithms. <clears throat> um, there are 130 FDA approved 510K algorithms on the market right now, meaning that any, any person can, can buy those if they like. And, and over the last few years, I've kind of changed my thought on this. <clears throat> Radiologists look for 10 to 15,000 things every time they look at the computer. And when you compare that with how many FDA approved algorithms there are, we have quite, quite a bit of room to make more and more algorithms. And if you really dig deep of these 130, there's only maybe 50 that do independent things. So this is just another indication that we're just so early in this process. Now, when, when I was introduced, you also mentioned that I'm a CEO of a, of a venture backed startup, which is very different to leave the healthcare space and go talk to venture capitalists and explain why my, my, my business needs to get funding. And so I, I see that the lessons that I learned raising money with, with VC are things that many of the AI companies haven't quite mastered yet. And so while we're moving in the right direction for radiology and AI and medicine and AI, I, I think the medicine, I, I think the, the dollar question really hasn't been answered that well yet. And only a few of our um, algorithms that are out there have figured out the whole business aspect, the patient aspect, and the data science aspect. And I'm going to kind of close the loop with this whole talk at the end with that exact um, with that exact notion. For for people who want to kind of play along at home, this link on here models.acrdsi.org. Um, this is the one that lists every FDA approved algorithm, and they update it you know once a month or so, so you can kind of see um, by uh, body type or by modality, what's kind of out there now. And you'll, you'll see that the most are, most are mammo and most are chest. And what Payush was saying is um, radiology leads with all of these articles that we publish every year. We're kind of at a little bit of an advantage because everything's on images and you can label images and send them to the data scientists and machine learning engineers to build your algorithm. So, so we are a little bit prepped to be able to do that. Um, so I'm gonna pass this over to Kent now, who's gonna talk about some specific things of what's happening with uh, AI and neuro, lung, and ultrasound, and we'll start with neuro first. Thanks, Ty, and uh, thanks for the invitation to everyone to uh, to be here and talk. It's uh, it's it's really great. <clears throat> so we're just going to hit some of the wave tops here. We obviously can't dive deep into all 130 algorithms, um, but uh, I just kind of want to lead in a little bit with. Um, and if you've read Ty's first book, you know. Uh, but sometimes this is washed out. Frequently, the most um, the most uh, headline grabbing algorithms in radiology are going to be the ones that, that, that do the diagnosis. So the ones that, that, that steal the show are, you know, pneumonia being predicted by computers better than radiologists than, 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 than human radiologists. But the truth is, is that there's so many different steps along the path from, uh, uh, for, for image acquisition, um, interpretation, proper protocoling, and AI can really help along every step of the way, not just the image interpretation. So to start out with, um, we'll start with one that, that, that got a lot of headlines last fall um, in the neuroimaging space. And this is the uh, Viz AI algorithm. Uh, you know, so, so specifically this one, um, uh, and one reason it got so much attention is because of the CMS um, 
uh, additional payment, but this algorithm is able to detect on CTAs of the head if there are areas of large vessel occlusion. And basically the way that it, that it proved its value, proved its value enough so that, so that the, the Centers for uh, Medicare and Medicaid were willing to pay extra money for it to be used, um, is that uh, it is able to speed up the time to um, intervention. So it, once the large vessel occlusion is detected on the CTA, it will contact a uh, neuro interventionalist directly. Um, and then they showed in various studies that the time from diagnosis to the time of actual intervention was decreased by between 24 and 69 minutes, depending on location. Um, and so this was, this was a, a huge boon, um, uh, obviously much better for the patient to have intervention done sooner, you know, time being brain in, this, in the setting of a stroke. Um, it was able to show significant decrease in ICU stay times and an overall hospital stay up to three days. Um, and it also showed that there was some increased rate of thrombectomy, probably because they were getting to lesions which could be intervened upon in time before they had progressed to a point where they were no longer intervened upon. So as I kind of mentioned uh, or, or alluded to, this got a lot of headlines because of the um, additional uh, uh, reimbursement that was offered by uh, Medicare. Uh, and you know, specifically, uh, this was offered. It, so the only times you could get the additional payment is, is, is if the patient was a, was a loss uh, maker for your hospital, meaning that you were going to um, get less money uh, or it was going to cost you more money to treat the patient than it was going to than 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 you would get back from from uh, Medicare for it, uh, and so you know and the and the offering was just at one thousand forty dollars, but I think the real takeaway here is with decreased ICU stays, decreased hospital stays overall, um, and being able to intervene on lesions sooner, all of those are going to lead to less cost to the hospital uh, for these patients. So, you know, even though the, even though you're, you're only getting paid if the, if the patient is, is a loss for you, um, this is still a, a good reason to use it is it will decrease the overall cost um, of treating the patients if it's, if it's going to be used accurately. And then just uh, briefly here, staying in the neuro space, um, another thing that, that computer vision does really well, which is very tedious and time consuming for um, human radiologists is segmentation. And there are various algorithms which can um, segment uh, uh, normal and abnormal brain tissue. So one example is um, lesion quant from core tech labs or um, ICO brain from Icometric. They both do um, MS plaque segmentation and then volume analysis. So this is really good for um, kind of watching patients over the long term because the measurements that the machines can give you will be more reproducible, done more quickly, and it will save the radiologist the time of having to do it manually, which can be quite tedious. Um, and another use uh, of the segmentation models is in um, different neurodegenerative conditions. So again, like the normal brain parenchyma and different parts of the brain can be segmented and then volumes can be acquired from that segmentation. And then um, uh, these, these volumes can be compared against um, age and gender match norms and can assist in the diagnosis um, of different uh, uh, neurodegenerative conditions, which again is just kind of saving time for the neuroradiologists, um, making the reporting perhaps more impactful and more meaningful uh, over the long term. Um, so another example uh, that we have that we wanted to touch on is in the area of lungs. So, um, you know, CAD is something that's pretty well known to all radiologists. That's uh, uh, computer assisted diagnosis. Um, and it has been kind of maligned in the past, but now with the new wave of uh, deep learning and machine learning, um, CAD is kind of getting new life uh, as, the, as the algorithms get better and more efficient at uh, actually picking up on real nodules and not, and not wasting radiologists time by having them chase a lot of uh, nodules, which are, which are uh, not nodules at all. Um, some of the different things, you know, there, there are probably 10 or so or, or more now um, different, different lung nodule algorithms out there. Some of the features that they offer are um, one touch segmentation and quantification. So it can give you volumes just by clicking or circling a particular nodule instead of having to measure in three planes. Um, it can automatically compare to prior studies. So it can make it easier to evaluate the changes in time um, uh, to determine if it's a concerning nodule or just one of the many granulomas that we see every day. Um, there is integration 
into the report for some of these. So instead of having to dictate in or type in the measurements and the slices, it can actually be pushed directly into your report. So again, increasing radiologist efficiency. Um, and then there are some also that do um, automatic lung RADS uh, uh, calculations for you. And that can be put right into the report as well. So that again, you're saving time, saving extra uh, uh, you know, mental resources for the radiologist so they can burn through more and more lung cancer screenings especially as uh, the, the pool for lung cancer screenings has been recently opened up. Um, one algorithm which was, which was a little bit uh, uh, different, a little bit um, innovative uh, in its, in its uh, uh, presentation was the clear read CT from uh, Riverain. And that's the, the uh, picture that we have up on the screen now is sort of a graphic or a artistic rendering of what it, what it would do. But essentially, um, the algorithm is able to locate and segment the normal pulmonary vasculature and then subtract all of those vessels out, which would then highlight the, the pulmonary nodules. So kind of making them easier to see, um, you know, I guess in a, in a situation where you're working quickly, this would just be a much more efficient way to see the nodules. Obviously, uh, algorithms like this, you need to do some testing and you need to get some uh, confidence in it to make sure it's not subtracting out nodules that, 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 are, that are true. But if it works the way it's designed, it could really increase workflow for, for really the most tedious part of any chest CT, which is the nodule hunting that's involved. Uh, and then next, we have a couple of algorithms in uh, the ultrasound space that I wanted to touch on. Um, so one of them is this uh, uh, Meadow.ai um, algorithm, which is which is used for um, diagnosis of developmental dysplasia in infants. So, um, if anyone has done any ultrasounds, uh, read ultrasounds, performed ultrasounds on infants looking for the the developmental dysplasia of the hips, um, it can become very apparent that based on different tech level of expertise, uh, different tech level of um, knowledge or skill level, you can get very different pictures. It it is possible to make an abnormal hip look normal based on the pictures you're given or a normal hip to look abnormal. Um, and then similarly, the angles measured by the radiologist, there can be some variability. You know, hopefully on good images, the images are, or the, the, the angles would be fairly reproducible, but even so, there's gonna be a little bit of variance between um, uh, radiologists when they're interpreting the images. Uh, what this algorithm does is instead of having to acquire single still images to make your measurements off of, you do about a two minute sweep um, of, of ultrasound through the infant's hips. And then it, the algorithm is able to create, um, you know, 3D rendered uh, 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 models. And then it's able to give you more reliable, more reproducible measurements to determine um, if developmental dysplasia is present. Um, and again, this is something which, you know, it can be a big hindrance on, on, on a more family's life, uh, patient's life, if, if they have to be in the braces and things, but, you know, it could, hopefully decrease uh, overdiagnosis and um, increase the specificity. And again, you're just taking out the, the inter-observer variability, which is inherent in ultrasound imaging. And then kind of in a similar vein, um, there is a uh, algorithm uh, or a program from Caption Health, which is for echocardiography specifically. And this uh, program is able to provide real-time guidance and instructions to someone who's performing um, uh, echocardiography. And so again, the, the images you get um, could be uh, highly variable depending on the skill of your echocardiographer and, and, and the cardiologist is relying on them to provide good imaging. Um, so this could kind of help point the, the tech into the right direction, make sure that they're acquiring the highest quality images. Um, one other downstream effect is that it could increase access to care. Um, so instead of having to have someone who is very specifically trained um, in echocardiography, they showed in a study that you could take nurses with just, uh, just, just, just an hour of training with the ultrasound machine. And if they use this, the, the, the algorithm, they could get diagnostically adequate evaluation of the left ventricular and right ventricular size, um, it, they, they, they were good at determining left ventricular function, and they could find if there's a presence of pericardial effusion. Obviously not all inclusive, but even those small areas, if you're in a small rural place or an area that has decreased 
um, decrease access to the subspecialists or the or the specially trained techs. This could open up a lot of different avenues uh, for for increasing access to care, getting more patients to be seen um, when when they need to be seen. And then. Finally, I wanted to touch on something just briefly, which is not so much image-based, but more in the reporting space. So Rad AI is a company which has a product which will analyze the findings which, which a radiologist dictates, and then it will create automatically the, the impression block for it. So this is a great way to save time for the radiologist. You know, it's gonna save you one or two minutes having to reread your report. It'll auto-populate it. It'll, it'll, it'll put in the recommendations that you would normally use. Um, and it could also be great for those really complex cases where maybe there's several findings and maybe there's a pertinent finding like acute pancreatitis, but you know there's also an adrenal nodule which you forgot about when you were looking at all the free fluid in the belly and trying to determine if there was any you know necrosis in the pancreas and then that adrenal nodule gets forgotten and it doesn't get put down into the impression. This algorithm uh, could help to make sure that those those important pertinent findings don't get lost uh, for the for the noise, especially in those acute type of cases. So that's another great way where it's not it's not actually involved in the imaging at all. It's 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 entirely a natural language processing um, algorithm, but it's able to increase efficiency, save time, and then hopefully increase value to the patients, making sure that some of those more impactful findings are translated into the uh, into the into the bottom of the report for the for the clinicians. And so I'll throw it back to Ty. That's what I want to touch on here briefly. And thank you so much for your attention. Awesome. Thanks very much, Kent. Um, so so I, I like things when they're a little bit different. So that's what this next part, part is going to be. Thinking differently of, of how we can collect the data to train the algorithms. And as Payu said, there are many places that are collecting data repositories, BrainX being one of them. Stanford has some, Harvard has some, Chicago has some. Um, and that that has an inherent bias of what can we even build if it has to have a data repository to start. And so if someone said that they wanted to do a, an adrenal adenoma um, uh, algorithm, they would have to be limited by what um, data is already out there. And so what I want to talk about here is um, there are trillions, probably trillions of, of things that are stored on radiology systems like all of ours. And what can we do differently to help with that? And so I'm gonna dive in with an example with chest X-rays. Um, so th there are definitely millions of chest X-rays on packs somewhere, and they are labeled in a sense, like radiologists have dictated reports and there's an impression that's associated with that. Uh, and so if there is a way to kind of combine the current way of saving things with what data scientists and machine learning engineers care about, we can, essentially make an almost unlimited data source. And that, that just requires a little bit of forethought. And so what I'm gonna show now is not being used and it's not really ready to be done yet, but I just wanna plant seeds for people who watch this live or see this video that there is a way to capture this data if we think about it from a little bit of a, of a further view. So whenever you talk to a data scientist and they wanna have a great algorithm, they're gonna talk about training, testing, and validating sets of data and they specifically put it in those buckets so they can make sure they have the the most accurate output at the end and so so a, tra a training set you need to have something that's abnormal and probably something that's ab that's normal but you have to have something to label so in this example uh, acute rib fracture um it's, i mean we've seen tons of traumas and we, if we just label them as acute rib fracture then they could be mined later when it was needed but that's a pretty easy thing to do uh, obviously, normals, those are reasonably well labeled right now. Uh, so imagine going into a PAX and they're saying, uh, show me 10,000 right posterior rib fractures. Like that's, that's not out of the realm of possibility. And so from the data scientist standpoint, they could collect 10,000 of the ones that I just said, and then collect another you know, couple thousand for the validation sets while they tune the algorithm. So the machine learning engineer relies on the data scientist to make sure that they have the proper number of labeled studies and the, the proper um, uh, difference of vendors and difference of uh, genders and ethnicities to make sure that the data is, is homogeneous, uh, homogeneous. And then once they have that uh, homogeneous data, then they can start putting in the training and validating set. And so again, so the, the machine learning engineer can ask for the next chunk just by querying a PAX or some sort of uh, pseudo 
uh, search system tune, and then they would have a chance for a separate testing set. And that is something that was never used in the training, never used in the validation, but a totally separate testing set. And the, te the separate testing set would be from all different vendors and different parts of the country and, and as much, as much uh, variability as possible to make sure that this algorithm can be as robust as possible. And that's a word that they use quite a, quite a bit is robustness is, is how well you trained it on being uh, usable on all different uh, modality or all different uh, vendor uh, types. So if we were going to use the BrainX repository or the Stanford one, uh, we, we would have to rely on the people who made it to make sure that it's properly um, scrubbed to PHI, uh, properly uh, diverse, and, and that puts a lot of uh, reliance on those hosts of those um, data stores. Now, don't get me wrong, that's, that's our only option right now. We don't, we, don't have, we don't have another alternative to that. And so that's the best we've got. Uh, but, I, but I pose it to, to us that are thinking about it is how can we leverage the data that's already out there? And so um, some of the natural language processing engineers say, well, why don't we just do NLP on the reports and then we can put them in these categories reasonably well. And, and of course, many people have tried to do that. And, and that is just not ideal. It's not specific enough to, to have the training, validating, and testing sets be uh, done that way. It's, it's usually a little bit more granular that needs to be done by a human. <clears throat> um, so this is kind of uh, the full circle with what I was talking about before. So sitting in front of many venture capitalists as I pitched my, my AI company to them, um, of course, venture capitalists, like, how do, how do I make money? Like, how do I make money with this? And you have to be able to answer, you know, the question for that. And th this is something that I would kind of plant in all of our heads as we're moving forward in this as well. Um, so can the, can the machine learning engineers and data scientists like physically do it? And usually that's a data constraint. And so, um, as I mentioned before, if, if we want to do adrenal adenoma, I, I don't know if there's a big enough data set publicly available for them to do that. And so they, they couldn't physically do that. Um, at, at this point. Um, and then is it clinically helpful to find it or to determine if it's a, a functioning or non-functioning of your lymphoma? Well, I mean, I, I don't know. Like I, I don't really take care of patients with, with the adrenal problems and I'm not sure how big of a problem that is, but that's something that we want to know is like, what's the, what's the population? What's the help that we can give the third party payers? What's help we can give with CMS? Like we need to, we need to know like how it's gonna help clinically and then similarly, third-party payers and CMS, you know, does it have a business value? And this is something that really changed, in my opinion, over the last 12 or so months. Um, all during my medical training and probably all of our medical training, you know, we're, we're taught to take, take care of the patients and, and do the best we can and, and sort of not put like the dirty money into it and worry about billing. And, and, and I, I still feel that way to an extent, but... That, that's not a way to like move forward if, if you want to make a change. So in, in order to make a real change, you have to align the incentives. And for the, for the providers in us, you know, we, we have to either adopt this kind of align of incentives that include money um, or work with someone who, who can do that. And so um, my, my personal company that I made is not a radiology company. It is for telemedicine. And so we evaluate the telemedicine encounter using the video, the audio, the tone, and we run all algorithms and all that. And, and the question is, can developers do that? Absolutely. There were 500 million telemedicine encounters last year. Lots, lots of data that we can use for that. Um, is it clinically helpful? We're, we're starting to see a lot of data supporting net promoter score as, um, as an indication for customer satisfaction. And with so many different places to use telemedicine, the place with the highest satisfaction might win. And so, so we want to have the, the patients kind of go there. Um, the business value is interesting for this one. Uh, for in-person medicine, people do things like the ongoing professional evaluation, OPPEs, and they go and watch providers do what they do and they give a grade. And when the joint commission comes by, they can give that report back. Um, if someone was going to do that for 500 million telemedicine encounters last year, I mean, that's, that's an infinite amount of work. And so um, by applying AI, computer vision, natural language processing 
to this process, um, we can decrease that time to nearly zero um, and with the scalability of the Oliphant algorithm. So, so this is an example that I've learned very, very uh, crucially over the last several months as I pulled on investors and I've had to come back and talk to them. So, um, so I, I, I wanted to put this spin of, I, I know we're talking about image-based in the traditional sense, but I'm using the image-based algorithms in a, in a different sense there too. So what I'm gonna move to now is just a little bit of, um, obviously it's a self-promotion because it's a book, but, but it's um, like anyone can write a book. It was remarkably e easy. And so I'm just gonna give just a the quick rundown of how Kent and I made this book like the nuts and bolts, like literally how do you do it? Um, <clears throat> and, and then I'm open to questions and, and uh, Pius can share my email and you guys can find me on LinkedIn and I'm happy to help and I'm sure Kent will help as well. But, but ultimately this, this is how it started. Um, I, I felt strongly about this and anyone who's seen me on LinkedIn knows that I'm, I'm moderately obnoxious on LinkedIn with my posts. And so I made a 10 post series of the things that I thought were most important about AI and radiology um, two years ago. Uh, and I got feedback on LinkedIn and they would say, oh, you know, uh, did you think about this or think about that? And so my next one, I'd, I'd kind of in include some of the feedback. And so then I had kind of 10 chapters because I wrote these 10, 10 LinkedIn posts. Uh, and so then I was like, oh, I can, I don't know, how hard is it to turn into a book? So I Googled like, how do you make a book on Amazon? And, and there's many places that tell you how to do it. And so <clears throat> um, you, you save the text as a certain file and then that can be put into the into Amazon. I'm like, okay. And so I did that. And then, and as I was going through the process, it's like, oh, how do you want your cover to look? Where are your, where are your illustrations? I'm like, ah. So then I went to a site called Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R, -R, which <clears throat> You can hire people to do art and to do illustrations and to literally make Amazon covers. Um, and for not a lot of money, say fifty or hundred dollars, like you can hire great graphic designers to make all the things that you've seen on this presentation today. Um, and then you kind of go back and forth and you kind of tweak it to how you like it. Uh, and then once you have those, then you just upload those to a thing called Amazon uh, Kindle Direct Publishers, where you um, can put put your book. And then from there, it gets pushed over to Amazon and it's, and it's free to do that. And so, <clears throat> yes, I get it. This is you know, totally, totally um, showing our book on here, but I, I did want it to show like anyone who feels strongly about something. So Ayush Anesthesia, if you're feeling it, like if you wanna get a book out there, I'm very happy to help you do it. And, and there's a way to do it. Um, and so that is that. So um, I'm going to pause there, see if we have any questions. And then uh, th there's a few more things I was going to touch on with some of the algorithms way back at the beginning, but uh, I'll, I'll pause now for questions. So Payush, if you have any questions, happy to go there, or if, if any from the audience, we can do that too. Yeah, Ty, no, that, that was uh, very interesting. And I think uh, Kent and you touched upon a few different points. And whether you're in academia and you're looking for like that NIH funding, or you are uh, in the startup mode and you're looking for the venture, uh, capital uh, funding. I mean, to uh, as I put in the chat, to deliver on our mission, we all need funding, and I, I think that's very important points that you make about that. And I think about the book. Uh, it's very important that whatever we learn, whatever we share, we express that. And uh, this is a very social uh, media active world, and uh, you know there there are a lot of things that go on. Uh, and get discussed very actively, but there still needs to be a repository of knowledge. And I think whether it's through web pages or through books, I think th those still uh, are, are important for us. And I loved reading your book. I think very, very insightful. The best part, part I liked about it, it, it uh, communicated very directly. Uh, it is uh, short and sweet and to the point. So I uh, just loved uh, reading that. Reading that, and thanks for sharing your insights uh, about uh, you know how to go about doing this. Because I think a lot of us do want to have some way and want to learn about how to uh, express ourselves, which is very very important. Uh, I do see some questions over here, so I'm I'm going to let you take those questions, Ty. But thank you. Sure. So the first one says, could you touch upon where you see multimodal algorithms in the next several years? Um, and so I'm interpreting that multimodality. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about that. 
However, if you put that, the question, you have another question, just correct me and tell me what you want to say. Multimo oh, oh, so perfect. Um, and so th this is, I mean, I have a very, very good story for this, in, in my opinion. So when I got out of the Navy three years ago, um, totally, yep, got it. Um, when I got out of the Navy three years ago, like I thought I was going to be only doing AI algorithm as a consultant. I was going to be the subject matter expert. I was going to be the domain expertise, helping the algorithms build um, what's going to be happening next. And so the, the company that I was working with was doing pulmonary nodules. And I specifically said, okay, we're doing the computer vision on the imaging, but are we going to do anything with age, gender, smoking history, cancer history? Uh, and the computer scientist said, no, 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 we don't need that because um, our algorithm is going to be so good. And I was just like, Yes, I was dumbfounded because it was like a nodule and a 17 year old person with leg pain and a nodule and a 65 year old person with 20 years smoking look identical and are very different. And so just a tiny bit of data can make an enormous, enormous change. And so we're finally seeing how we're understanding that it can't just be computer vision. It has to be NLP. It has to be some other way to pull in the data. And one of the biggest barriers, as we all know, um, Epic, Cerner, NextGen, Allscripts, don't love to share their data. Like they don't make it easy to do it and they make it expensive to do it if you're gonna do it. And so uh, so many of the places, Stanford, Chicago, Harvard, are, are definitely opening up to pull in gender, comorbidities, other things to make the algorithms much, much better. Uh, Kent kind of talked about this a bit with uh, Icometrics. I don't know if, if this is fully, uh, fully operational yet, but they want to have an app in the hand of the patient with multiple sclerosis so they can track patient data and clinical data and imaging data. And so that's, to me, that's like the ultimate multimodal where we have um, clinical, clinically like reproducible data, patient data, which might be a little bit noisier, but might have some things that we never thought of, and then the clinical imaging data. Um, and then therapeutics all the stuff you kind of expect. Um, so I'm going to pause there and see if Kent has anything specific to add, but if not, I'm going to go into the therapeutics. So Kent, did you have anything? So I'll just, I, I'll, I'll just make one hopefully fairly quick point, and that's, you know, if you're, if you're going to choose these projects uh, or these uh, initiatives with, with multimodality, which I do think is probably the, the way things will go because the more information, the better. It's probably good to choose your spots carefully because there was a paper that came out I want to say like eight or so months ago, um, and they were talking about and it, 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 it was it was for PEs, and so they looked at images and they looked at the patient's medical record, and they they did a comparison of different algorithms, comparing the information, you know, whether from imaging alone, whether from the medical record and imaging, whether from the medical record alone, and I think what it really boiled down to is they said that the imaging was probably the best, or was it was at least like nearly as good as the imaging and the medical record which makes a lot of sense if you think about it because PE is, is really an imaging diagnosis. I mean, like obviously there's, there's clinical findings, but if the imaging shows a PE, there's a PE. Um, so like it may have been one of those things where that may not have been the best, the best uh, 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 you know, case for looking at, you know, as, as wasn't like, like congestive heart failure, that's a lot more, it's, 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 it's gonna involve patient labs, maybe plus, plus or minus a chest X-ray, plus or minus history. So just, Kind of choosing your spots for those, um, I think. Uh, but but multimodal is probably the way that things are going to have to go. And then the, the one thing I was going to kind of tip over to with the therapeutics is finally some of the big contract research organizations and Image Core Labs are saying, well, what if we could really titrate the amount of therapeutics we need to give to make a change on the imaging? And we, we, radiology always knows that imaging doesn't necessarily time exactly. We could lag. We could be. We could not be mapped exactly but certainly for like new adjuvant chemo like what if they can give a slightly lower dose and get the same amount of response for the size and then the surgeons can do their thing and finally that loop is being connected and it's and it's taken a while i'm kind of surprised that it took as long as it did but th those are examples of how um you know putting all that stuff into the giant spreadsheet and let the computer scientists figure it out um has been has been pretty awesome um so i think that's a good overview of the of the multimodal and awesome question i totally appreciate that um, so one person said a uh, question regarding AI, uh, x-ray algorithms for AI, and then it looks like they kind of summed it up at the bottom and say, what's the minimum exclusive x-ray algorithms be required for basic radiologic app for diagnostic x-rays? And so 
so I interpret this as my original talk where I was saying, or my original slide where I said we're at 130 now and we need 10,000. Um, so Stanford did publish um, an algorithm that looked like 25 findings on one x-ray, one chest x-ray. And th that was a pretty thorough thing, like cardiomegaly and failure and atelectasis and pneumonia and pneumothorax. Like they had a pretty good list of stuff. Um, it kind of comes back to the radiologist templated reports. Like, and anytime it's a template report, I almost never push send. I always change something on there. And so what are the permutations and combinations of all of those things? I don't know. Like, I'm kind of thinking like in the hundreds, like, because sometimes when I see this, I kind of want to tweak that. And then once you put lines and tubes in there, everything kind of goes out the window. So I think we have to put some guardrails on that question. And so if it's going to be for strictly just a place that doesn't have access to x-rays, awesome. Big pneumonia, big pneumothorax, um, failure. Um, TB, like, sure, we could dial it down with like 12 algorithms. And I think there are places that are doing that, Stanford included, where you can take a plain film and take a picture and get a, a good sense of what's going on there. Um, but for uh, trauma centers where there's lines and tubes, like, we need hundreds to really make a difference um, on that one. So I, I totally appreciate uh, that question. And I think we have to put guardrails depending on what um, area. And if you want to put guardrails up, and I'll, I'll happily address that too. Um, this one says, uh, the opportunity is clear for computer vision and telemedicine. Can you please comment on barriers? Uh, two, two of the big barriers that I've come across now is um, depending on the audience. And so <clears throat> when I'm talking to a small group where, it's, where there could be some egos involved, you want to tell me that I'm doing a bad job, uh, that, that's a barrier. But a large group where there's tens of thousands of providers and we just need to find who the lowest performers are to help them, um, that, that has been helpful. So knowing my audience has been a barrier that I've had to learn. And then two, um, not everyone records their videos and rightly so because it's enormously expensive to record 500 million videos. Um, but just like if you call any customer service, I'm not trying to say doctors are just customer service, but just like you call a customer service, like they can be recorded for quality insurance purposes for a short amount of time, evaluated, then deleted. And so I, I would say those are two, two totally reasonable uh, barriers. One, um, audience to recording. Um, I just saw one that came in. My main space of side anesthesia is extended really in healthcare, uh, in a reality in healthcare. Lots of uses in space, but are you, oh, thank you, got it. Uh, <clears throat> so it's just totally brainstorming about, about anesthesia. And I mean, I said it one anesthesia like a million years ago. Um, and maybe Payush, we can have this a little bit of a discussion <clears throat> Similarly, if someone said, oh, I can tell you exactly what to twist the knobs of the isofluorine and then you just do nothing, like, like, of course, like you're looking at things and there's too many like back and forths for you to feel comfortable with that. And so you couldn't say, oh, all we need is seven different patient types or 22 different patient types. You need probably like a thousand. So, but Payusha, I'll, I'll just, do you, have you thought about that? Has, has anybody tried to make like an auto uh, anesthesia, um, general anesthesia type algorithm? Yeah, I think there is there is a lot of uh, amazing work going on uh, over here. And uh, actually, Dr. Maheshwari uh, has a lot of interest. He has actually done some work in this space, and he uh, has uh, done some validation work for us on AI algorithm. And uh, just a brief introduction, because I know him very well. Uh, he's a, a member of BrainX and one of the founders for BrainX and BrainX community. Uh, so I'll let Kamal talk about it. He, he's our expert on that. Cool. Sure. Uh, thanks, Piyush. You can hear me, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Ty, and you know, thanks a lot for your time and all the insightful uh, information. Yeah. So I think, like radiology field, actually anesthesia is the next field which is data rich, actually. But this data is actually is is kind of hidden, mostly on the monitoring platforms, and it's not captured. So it's not even captured for the moment. It just, just goes away, it drains from our system. And think about any 500 bed hospital and the continuous monitoring which is coming out. And you collate that with EHR information, with population health information, with evidence in the literature. Uh, the information is huge. And as you know, the right barrier at this point of time is obviously uh, the the integration of different system and different firewalls from security and uh, 
security purposes. And second one is uh, obviously, you know, we know, all know about Epic and <laughs> EHR's problem of not letting anybody innovate on, on top of their platform. And, and the third thing, which I'm missing also, I have at least in Cleveland Clinic has uh, taken care of all the barriers, but now I'm short of machine learning engineers. Like in our system, if I have statistician who can work on SaaS in our team, but if today, you know, if somebody said that I'm ready to work here at Cleveland Clinic within our system, um, I have a rich data set problem um, to answer and we can innovate. So that's the landscape we are working on. With regards to your specific question, that is called uh, under two categories. One is physiological closed loop systems. Uh, PL, uh, so those are in 2018, FDA came out with the, the regulations that they have specified what they're looking for. So physio for physiological closed loop systems. So those are including if you have oxygenation like pulse ox to hemodynamics, which is blood pressure, um, and medications are also coming along with that. There are three groups um, in the world who have developed um, anesthesia closed loop systems, uh, which is you uh, go on an infusion pump of propofol and uh, the depth of anesthesia is being maintained by, is, oh, yeah. is being monitored by EEG, which is BIS monitoring. Um, and you control that number and one is from India, from GD Puri. Uh, they have done like hundreds and thousands of cases and is patented. One is from France, from uh, Dr. Liu group. Uh, they are collaborator with our outcomes research. And um, so he has done even limit transplant under that system. Um, and uh, the, there's a group in, in Brussels uh, and actually with UCLA uh, partnership, and they have built uh, a closed loop. The problem with all these systems is uh, the, the prime time readiness, right? Uh, and there are a lot of barriers to for the prime time readiness. And because here's the politics of protectionism within anesthesia world, um, there's uh, obviously FDA is now moving. Uh, so we keep on following these, uh, uh, you know, the sessions by FDA and they are improving in the sense that after 21st Century Cures Act, uh, software as a medical device, and they're slowly coming with some guidelines how they want to regulate these things. It's eventual and it's the field is open, wide open. I'm just, if somebody tells me today that I'm ready to work with you uh, and, and these algorithms, we have full data sets and we know the whole problem. We know the people who have done it, right? It's just that we in the United States have not done it. So, so I uh, would love to hear your thoughts on this. Like, how did radiology overcome this barrier? And, and you know, what can anesthesia learn from that? What, what was the what were the pivotal moments, uh, or what was the main uh, energy uh, behind the the pivot there? So, I, I think when you could tag your friend in Facebook in 2011 and it would say, oh, this is my friend. And then it could automatically close square and say, oh, is this Ty? Like, I think people immediately saw, oh, radiology, let me do that. Let me bring this in front of venture capitalists and raise a bunch of money. And so, so I think that, honestly, that's, that's what happened. And so now the VCs are much more sophisticated. They don't want to see a gee whiz thing. They want to see something that's going to make a difference. And so what I would kind of push, what I would kind of reflect back is um, you, you have all this data. All you need is, is a machine learning engineer, data scientist, so thinking like thinking like an entrepreneur, um, how could how could that make money? Like, could you decrease time in the operating room or, or whatever the thing is that would save or make money? Put into a pitch deck, talk to a VC, and then hire the engin engineers and try it. it. It doesn't take much to to do that. And so I think we can probably take that offline for this call. But just so you know, like pre-seed venture capital is just a it's just a PowerPoint. Like, do they believe in what you're talking about and what your what your resources are? And so like that is a perfectly fundable thing if you use the Venn diagram. So, so I, I think just radiology was just lucky because they're like, ah, it's like Facebook. Let me, let me do that. And obviously it's not. What do you think about the role of the society there? Because I do see a lot of support from, from the radiology society 
Do you think the society played an, a, a very important role or was it more industry driven? So, I mean, my, my buddies at the ACR and RCA were going to be yelling at me, but to me, they were catching up. Like there was hundreds of millions of dollars of, of fresh back companies and ACR and RCA were like, what do we do with this? And now I think they're doing a really good job, quite frankly. Um, but I mean, it took them a while. It took, you know, a while to have the, the um, academics kind of catch up. Thank you. Um, I, I, I do want to, someone had a question over here um, that said, oh, 3D. Yeah. So, so how can AI radiology be utilized in 3D? And so going with the Venn diagram, um, what I see many people do is just like, oh, look, you can twist the joint. And it's like, who cares? Like, like that, doesn't, that doesn't make anybody any money. And so what can you do? Um, what if you could reconstruct the ACL and PCL in the exact frame that the orthopedic surgeon puts their scope in? Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Can they do a faster surgery because they can practice it before they even go in there? And so, so that is where we're gonna see um, the 3D visualization play out is like, what specific problem can we solve? And so um, I've never done a scalene block or whatever, but maybe if there's a way that you have the scalene muscles in there and you can practice you know, the exact right you know, something, 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 whatever the smart anesthesiologists do to make that better, faster, stronger. Um, so, so that, that is where I think we go. Like, what is the, what's the problem? Or maybe there's some new block that you guys want to try and you want to make, you know, a thousand different permutations and combinations of different patients and then try it on all them to, to see how it kind of works. So, so I think you would have to start more with the problem because of obviously you've got plenty of images, start with the problem and then say, how can we manipulate the images to help solve that problem? But I, to I totally agree. I, I, I love the use of the 3D. And we have so much stuff from Oculus, from the AR, VR stuff, and so much stuff from video gaming that we should be using that more. Totally got it. Hey, hey Ty, um, just to get clarity on my question, part of it is my naivete about the specialty of, of, of diagnostic radiology. So I, I, specifically, I'm curious, um, outside of the realm of like surgical planning, intraoperative guidance, and so forth, if there's any, if you as a, you know, a, a diagnostic radiologist um, see any use in, in your day-to-day -day workflow, um, because I, I really don't have much, I'm the world's worst anest or, uh, anest worst radiologist that you could possibly imagine. I don't have, I did maybe minimum rotation in med school and that's it. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Totally. And I'll open this up to Kent after my quick thought, and then we'll see if he thinks too, but um, so for like a shoulder arthrogram where we're looking for a slap tear uh, or any kind of labral tear, like those can be pretty subtle. And if you could literally make it like giant and I go in there and like try and look like the, the shoulder surgeon does like at a scale, like possibly, but then we get like, how much time does that take? And then, so, so I don't know exactly. Uh, my guess is it'll have to do something that humans can't do. So we have our current system and we use the AR, VR, 3D to do something we can't do, but Kent, do you have any thoughts on on that? No, I mean, but but the the, the thing about innovations is sometimes you don't know until you jump in and try. You know, there's going to be some stuff where it won't be helpful because like giving like a nice 3D rendering of the liver won't necessarily show you the mass that's like inside the liver itself. But just like Ty's saying, like maybe for some structures where you're more interested in the surface of it, blowing it up finding some way to look at it differently. I mean, we, we, we already do some 3D rendering, you know, with not non, non AI related, just from like image reconstructions. And sometimes they're really pretty pictures for the orthopods to look at. Sometimes it's really nice to show the patients and we, the radiologists blow them off and act like all hoity toity. Like we just like doing the cross-sectional stuff. We're too good for the 3D. Um, but you know, there, there definitely could be a use case and it's just going to be a matter of of coming across it and seeing, just like Titus said, like what, what, when is it going to improve, um, improve what we do, make us more effective? And then just, there is one um, currently available software for pulmonologists to do a bronchoscopic guided biopsy. And once they get into the deep, deep, deep tree down there, like it's like Google Maps, left, right, left, right, left, right, da, 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 and it correlates with what the CT is. And so I, I know that's just another extension of a, of a, surgical um, application, but, but man, oh man, the first time I saw that, it was legit that they were able to do that. That's, that's pretty complicated. A, a human couldn't do that blindly, so. Um, what do you think, Joe? Does that get closer to answer your question or did I still miss it? 
Yes, very much so. No, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, like I said, the question was really based on naivete of the typical diagnostic radiologist day. And so that's something I always ask specialists uh, about, you know, because I think that um, actually in the extended reality space, the lowest hanging fruit is really, I think, nearing a point of consolidation where, you know, the strikers of the Medtronics of the world are going to gobble up the the intraoperative guidance, um, surgical planning, particularly the intraoperative guidance, and to some extent they already have. I mean, there's a lot of stereoscopic things that are that are used in that space, and you know it's very lucrative. And um, there's already some really big successes in that space. And I think I think that's I guess analogous to um, you know a lot of these solutions that are um, you know image segmentation or mask or whatever uh, using the two dimensional. Uh, radiological images to improve your workflow. I, I feel like that's kind of, you know, it's, it's similar to what you said a little bit ago about the, you know, in 2011, there was, you know, identifying your face. I mean, it's, it's been 10 years now. And so I imagine that, um, you know, some of that low hanging fruit in the, in, in both of those spaces is, um, you know, kind of, kind of obvious, but um, nonetheless, it's, it's, it's very interesting to me. I was just at Hims and out of, I think it was 1200 some odd different vendors there. And I did a search just while I was there because everyone kept saying AI, AI, and it was a bunch of people that weren't doing anything even remotely that struck me as AI. And, um, it was like 986 of them claimed to be, they tagged their company with AI. So it's, you know, <laughs> it's just, it's, uh, Yeah. So even though I think they're probably late to the party, it's it's very interesting, and um, I, I'm just curious. Uh, that's just a general question I always ask. I think the Venn diagram you have is fantastic because it really does get at you know the center of that diagram is really going to be um, what um, a potential healthcare institution is going to be interested in, where those things you know overlap. So I completely agree. Joe, you know, uh, interestingly, uh, about your point about uh, use of interoperability. Uh, so again, that our uh, founder for BrainX and uh, co-founder for BrainX, Dr. Frank Pepe, that, that's his big focus area. And if you listen to some of his talks that uh, we have on our YouTube channel from the past, uh, that's where they're working on a lot of different solutions. And I think that some of the segmentation in in uh, you know real time. Uh, and overlaying of those images are, are some of the challenges that they're trying to overcome because you know it's more dynamic than a static image with moving right. parts. So I think they're trying to overcome those, but I think those are great thoughts. I, I, I think, uh, Ty, there is one more question over there. I want to make sure we capture that uh, from Shivani. Uh, uh, I, can, I can read it to you. Yeah, please do. I, I... Yeah. No worries. Uh, so Sh Shivani is asking, would the book which was mentioned in the presentation include the cost of obtaining the algorithms and the process through which they can be obtained for diagnostic radiology? No, I, I don't go into the cost and that's really variable. And so I'll just go over some of the high level stuff in the last couple of minutes we have here. Um, usually one data engineer and one, uh, one data scientist, one machine learning engineer for three to six months can do that they cost about 15 grand a month. So you can do that math, 15 grand times two times six is how much that staffing will cost. And then you have to buy the, the, the data, unless of course Paish has happens to have the data you want, but you probably have to buy it from one of the vendors that sell data. And there's a couple that do it now. Um, and so that, that's just the kind of cost of doing business. And then now to get FDA 510K approval, there's almost no way to do it without a consultant. And there are consultants that have done this 10, 20 times, and they know how to navigate this 200 page document of everything you need. And that is about a 10 to 30 grand investment. And so, so depending on how lean you can be and how much time you have in, in the several hundred thousand dollar range, like you could have something to market. And then ideally you started with a great clinical problem that you can pitch the investors and they say, I got it. And they're willing to do that. But, but of course, you send me a note on LinkedIn, we can dive deeper on that um, to get more into that. That's great, Ty. You know, I, I think thanks for answering the gr great discussion that followed uh, the presentations, so always, uh, you know, thinking of uh, more and more uh, stuff. Uh, for the last one, uh, and we are right on time, 
where do you where do you see radiology going? Do you see it evolving more in itself, or do you see it uh, evolving where it collaborates more with other specialties? As something that Joe was mentioning, getting into multimodal space, where, where do you see radiology going next with AI? Kent, do you want to go first, and then I'll finish, or do you you want me to go? No, no, you go ahead. Ty. I want to hear what you have to say too. <laughs> so one of the things, our infrastructure is not that awesome, even just to begin with, and so. Uh, it's going to be a while before radiology significantly changes. We have old, crusty radiologists like me that are happy just reading our studies. And so, so there, there's quite a bit of friction to move any, anywhere else. Now, what I would love to see are silos of, or snippets or areas of the population that are just awesome. So uh, breast cancer screening. Like, what, what if the radiologist owned that whole thing from beginning to end? Pink, pink ribbons and all, and we made sure everything happened. And we have a little bit of pieces in there, but there's still ladies in America that are getting their, their mammograms. And the radiologist is like, ah, oh, their primary care didn't do it. Primary care is like, ah, oh, they didn't want to do it. And so, so I would like to like look at those specific problems, um, may, maybe heat metrics like that or, or, or something else. But I, I would love to see radiology lean forward into the places where normally we're just sit back and and read our studies and sit in the dark. So, so I would love to see radiology lean forward, but it's going to be a while before that happens. And hopefully some of these new residents will see all these new things and they'll, they'll do that too. That's great. Cool. Well, Payush, so, I, I say thank you. And thank you to everyone else for hopping on this call. It was super nice to you guys. It was, it was great to meet you. And thanks for the questions. Yeah, thank you. And thank you uh, everyone for joining us. We'll post the YouTube video. Uh, onto our channel or we'll post the video on our YouTube channel soon. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Until next time, thank you, Ty. Thank you, Kent. And thank you, everyone else, for joining in the great discussion. Take care.